Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm a former Boeing 737 pilot and in this video I want to give you a bit of a guidance if, well, something happens that's probably every flight simmer's hidden dream, while at the same time being about every passenger's worst nightmare. And that is the situation of both pilots passing out in flight. So here we are in our Boeing 737, cruising around at flight level 370 and, well, we are just about halfway through our flight. All of a sudden you get that dreaded PA from the cabin crew that all of you simmers have been hoping for. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention please? Is there anybody on board who can pilot an aeroplane? Well, while you look into the other passengers' faces and you see their looks freezing up, your heart starts beating, you put up your hand and you're like, here, I can fly, I can fly. All right, so you come forward to the cabin crew and she tells you, well, you look like a 20 year old. Are you sure you can fly? And you tell her, well, I'm a multi thousand hour PMDG captain. While the cabin crew probably will have no idea whatsoever what you mean with that, the perspective to have somebody who tells you can fly an airplane will probably be enough to put you in that seat where you always want to go into, and that's obviously the captain's seat. But hold on a little. You may not be the only one on that airplane, and here's a little general advice to you. Now, even though you may have a good understanding of general airliner systems, if there is any private pilot on board, it may be a good idea to put that private pilot in the captain's seat and you occupy the first officer's seat, okay? Because those private pilots at least have hands-on experience flying a real airplane. And as good as those flight sims are, regardless if it is Microsoft Flight Simulator, X-Plane or whatever, as good as they are, there is just nothing, <laughs> nothing worth the experience of a real pilot, be it just a private pilot. In any case, Either way, you end up sitting in either the captain's or the first officer's seat. If there is no private pilot or anyone on board, it is a good idea to get a cabin crew into the cockpit as well. Because while you may have an uh, understanding of airplane systems, the cabin crew will have an understanding of what flying feels like. And he or she will be able to tell you things like, oh, this turbulence is normal, no need to worry, and this is a lot, and so on. So that's something. Also, the cabin crew will probably be a little bit more fluent in aviation English than you might be. So for that reason, she might help you on the radios as well. All right, so we're now sitting here. Let's take a moment to think about what to do next. You thought about it? Well, I bet. I bet you just about wanted to disconnect the autopilot and enjoy hand flying that lovely 737 to be able to tell whomever developer you are thinking about off in terms of their flight dynamics, right? Well, not quite. Okay. So let's get back to a little bit more reasonable thing that might happen. The very first thing I want you to do, and that is without any exception, is to do this. Reach down for the radio and dial in the frequency 1 to 1.5. It doesn't matter what frequency you're actually on, dial in 1 to 1.5 and put that active. This more or less works the same on any airplane. 1 to 1.5 active and then it is time to make that call. So, in case you didn't know, the radio is probably your most vital tool to surviving what you're currently in. So, at the back of the control column of the 737, you can see those little two buttons here, mic and interphone. You're looking for the one that's labeled mic. And that is your push to talk key. So that's the one you want to use. And what you are going to say is quite simple. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Use your flight number, your airplane registration, or your call sign, regardless of what you know. If you're a flight simmer, you will probably have an idea where to get your call sign. If you're not, you don't need to be. So, if you are a flight simmer, you go progress page, 
All right, here's your call sign. That works in most aircraft, for sure in all the Boeings and all the Airbuses. If you're not a flight simulator, just use the flight number and the airline name. So, for example, Mayday, 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 Germania 737. And that's all you need to do. You don't need to leave any lengthy messages or anything. Just this. And there will be an answer on that frequency over here. Might not be that easy to understand. It might be something very, well, technical at first. But there will be somebody answering. And then you can just use plain English. You don't need to know any aviation English. You can just go ahead. Mayday, 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 Germania 737. Both pilots passed out. I am not a pilot. And that is going to be all. From that moment, the, the aircraft around you and all air traffic control stations on the ground know that there is something they need to pay a little bit of attention to. What's going to happen now is probably one of two things. Either some air traffic controller will try to talk you through or, in a better case, there might be an airliner in the area around you who knows the airplane. And that is what I would probably expect. So, if something like this happens, and you are currently flying in a Boeing 737 or an Airbus aircraft or anything the likes, then what is most likely going to happen is air traffic control will pick an, another airplane of the same aircraft type in the region and those pilots will be able to help you out. Air traffic control will make sure that that airplane is going to stay somewhere near you and those pilots will talk you down. So what about can you expect to happen then when those pilots talk you down? Well. Obviously, things are going to vary depending on if those people are overloaded by the situation and whatnot. But here is the most important thing. If you are a flight simmer, you think you have knowledge of the airplane that you're sitting in, don't touch anything. If you're not a flight simmer and you have no idea about the airplane, even better, don't touch anything. Simply use that radio and let the people who are in contact with you talk you down. So, what do you need then in order to land the airplane? Most importantly, an airport with an ILS. Do not attempt to manually fly the airplane. You will not make it. You can have as many thousand hours in flight simulation as you want to. You will not make it manually flying that airplane. You will not. So don't even try. So here's a little background. When I started flying the 737, I had many years of actively flight simming and using the PMDG 737 and so on. Nonetheless, it still took me month and month of training to be able to put that airplane down on the runway in a halfway decent shape. And that was with an experienced training captain sitting right next to me. Imagine what's going to happen. If you sit there, you haven't seen how to fly a real airplane yet, you're an expert Microsoft flight simulator or X-plane flight simulator or whatever, but all of a sudden you're sitting there in an actual airplane. You would probably be able to fly the airplane in the air. You would not be able to fly the airplane close to the ground. In real life, there are so many factors influencing airplane flight behavior close to the ground that chances are, even when you really try, something would catch you off guard, you would not be able to recover and that's it. For that reason, keep the autopilot on. Do an auto land. Now here's a little bit of a background. In the 737, as well as any Airbus model, you're able to do auto lands on runways that are not even equipped for auto lands. So, chances are, during the pre-flight, your pilots have already programmed a route in your flight computer 
and the airplane will be more or less able to guide itself down along that route. In any case, when you have another flight close to you who is going to talk you down, chances are ATC is going to give that flight all your details. And that means that those pilots will be able to tell you what to do. So here is the most basic things we need to do in order to set ourselves up for the landing. So those pilots are probably going to tell you, okay, you are going to fly to this airport. In order for the airplane to be able to land itself automatically, you need to dial in a few things. So they will describe to you the location of the buttons in question. And for 37 it's very easy. All you need is this the courses and the frequencies. The pilots will be able to tell you, or the pilots from the other airplane via the radio will be able to tell you courses and frequencies. The more advanced flight symbols of you obviously know how to look them up on the approach reference page, so course 269 frequency 110.10. So here we go. Let's put 269 into the course and they will, they will tell you how to do it. Even if you're sitting in an airplane that you've never seen before, they will tell you where to find those things. So we have 269 and 269. Oh, so that is one thing we need. The other is the frequency. And we got 110.10 and they will tell you how to put that into the NAF radios. Here we go, 110.10 and 269. And that is all we need in order for the airplane to be able to land itself. The next thing is simply put down the autopilot altitude all the way down to the bottom and then let the airplane fly itself down. So let's go ahead and do that. That is probably what you would be told in a real situation as well. Altitude, dial it all the way down to zero because, well, obviously you could do something else and put in some proper altitude. But in my opinion, if you've got somebody sitting in the airplane who's not really familiar with it, it is the best thing to let the computer fly the airplane down. And if your pilot did a decent job in the pre-flight, they will have put an arrival into the flight computers. And if there is an arrival in, then even with the altitude set down to zero, the airplane will be able to guide itself all the way down on the approach. Alright, and with that, you are basically set up to do your emergency landing. So let's go ahead and fast forward a little bit to the point where things are going to happen. So I'm just about going to turn on some time acceleration over here. And we are going to fly the airplane all the way up to the top of descent. Now, if you're sitting in a Boeing airplane, the moment you pass the top of descent, the plane is going to start descending on its own. If you sit in an Airbus airplane, just dial the altitude down, and when you're at any point close to the top of descent, just hit that altitude knob, push it in, and the plane's going to start descending all by itself. Alright, so, we're sitting in a Boeing today, and here we go. The thing starts descending on its own. And it is going to descend all the way along your arrival routing, all the way to the point where it is going to intercept the ILS. And that is because VNAV is simply going to do its job. Even if you did not prepare anything in the FMC, then VNAV is still going to fly you down. Now, if you've got that other flight crew still talking to you over the radio, and I would kind of expect air traffic control to put them on a vector, to put them next to you, maybe even into visual contact so that they can follow you and talk you all the way down through the approach, then what they are going to tell you is just to monitor a few things. They will probably tell you something about the FMA to make sure that your airplane is actually following the VNAV path. So they will probably tell you you've got VNAV PTH up here and not, for example, VNAV speed. If you do get into VNAV speed, well, then they will probably tell you to use the speed brakes to get back down on the profile. But all of that really is a situation 
that I do not even think you would get into. In most cases the airplane is perfectly going to be able to fly itself down. But let's put a little bit of time acceleration on here once again and see how things are going to develop. So we are now descending, descending, descending. We are not going to do anything further on the airplane because anything you do has a chance of breaking something. And that is exactly what we want to avoid. Now, if everything goes fine, then even somebody who is not a pilot would probably be able to fly the airplane down like this. Somebody who is a little bit more into flight simming might be a little bit better in terms of what you can do with your airplane. So for example, somebody who is a flight simmer might be able to handle situations like the airplane getting off the VNAV path a bit better because they know what a speed brake is and know how to pull one and retract one again. Apart from that, however, if you're a flight simmer and you know how to enter, for example, a landing speed, then I would absolutely recommend you to do. So, for example, over here, you can just enter your reference speed. Nice. If you don't know how to do it, then don't try to play with the airplane in order to get it done somehow. There will be somebody on the radio who is able to tell you some general speed schedules that your airplane can fly that is going to take you down. And keep in mind, we're talking about one of the most significant emergency situations that you can possibly get into at the moment. Nobody cares if you're flying a couple knots faster or a couple knots too slow. Nobody cares. Right now we're flying through some clouds with some possible icing conditions in them. Since the temperature is minus 4, nobody cares. Your airplane is probably not going to crash if you don't know how to turn the anti-ice off. So you don't need to worry about things like these. Yes, there is a slight risk involved, but no, it is absolutely not a problem just to fly through these conditions, even if you have some ice building up, even if that ice breaks off your engine and gets sucked into the engine and damages some fan blade. Chances of an engine failure are rather slim, so do not worry about any of this. We're now getting down and you can see that our pilots did an, indeed enter an arrival. So we are simply going to follow this. Now here's a bit of things for you that will get important during the approach. First of all, there is altitude. So setting your local altimeter setting. In case you know how to do it, fine, do it. In case you don't, don't even bother with it. Even on standard QNH, your airplane's VNAV system is going to keep you safe. There are great margins built into procedure design, like certain vertical distances, certain heights that you need to have above the terrain. So you don't need to worry about this kind of stuff, even if you're on standard pressure while you are, well you name it, in a situation that is totally not in your favor. Like for example, let's say we've got a very low pressure system of a, with a QNH of maybe 970 hectopascals. Then yes, you would probably be flying about a thousand foot lower than you are meant to fly. However, procedure designs, even in that case, are probably going to keep you safe because there will be a great distance between you and the area below. Especially when you have mountainous terrain, then you are required by procedure design to have 2000 feet of separation to those mountains for the intermediate stages of the approach. Once you get from the intermediate fix to the final fix, those safety limits are going to start reducing. But don't worry too much about that. But instead simply trust your VNAV system. On top of that, if you're flying a Boeing or, a, or an Airbus aircraft and your pilots have done a proper job preparing the aircraft for the arrival, 
then those pilots would have entered the Q and H, and the VNAV system would have adjusted for that. So even with the standard pressure indication in a Boeing 737, you would still be flying the correct altitudes if you're using VNAV. So that's just something to keep in mind. So, on the way down on the approach, your supporting pilots or air traffic controllers or whoever are going to give you a little bit of a guidance of what to do. And if you're flying a Boeing 737, then around a speed of 210 knots, they will probably tell you to extend the flaps into the first notch. Now, that's something that you obviously still need to do manually and that they are probably going to explain to you how to do. So, if you're in that 737, remember to lift the lever up before you move it backwards, pretty much like so. You can see now the flaps are moving out and we are getting in for the approach. Alright, so, flaps are coming out. And at this point, you will probably also be asked just to extend the flaps into the 5 position. But if you're being accompanied by another aircraft of a similar type, then those pilots will be able to tell you exactly what to do. Also, when you get close to your destination airport, they are going to tell you to arm the autopilot for an automatic landing. Now, here's how to do it on most airliners. I'm just about taking out flaps into the 5 position, because at this point, intercepting the final course, you would certainly be told to do so. So now let's arm the autopilot for the automatic landing. And in most airliners, you will have something like an approach button over here. Press that button, and then engage the other autopilot. It doesn't matter if you're sitting in an Airbus or if you're sitting in a Boeing aircraft. It works the same. Okay. And then they will probably tell you to verify the capture modes of the autopilot, pretty much like we are doing right now. At that point you will also be asked to lower the landing gear, so let's go ahead and do that. And keep in mind, you need to pull the gear lever out in order to be able to move it. So that's the case on many aircraft switches, and something that you might not be accustomed to coming from flight simulation. You have to pull those switches out and then you're able to move them. That's a little safeguard in place to prevent you from accidentally being able to move the switch. I'm going to show you an example. Let's take a fuel pump switch over here. You see how the mechanism is made? So look closely as I'm about to move the switch. You pull it out and then you put it into the position. And that's how it works with most switches in aircraft cockpits. Okay, once established on the final, you will be asked to lower the flaps into a landing setting and they will, they will probably tell you some sort of a speed that you want to fly when you're in that setting. So let's go to flaps 30. If you're still in VNAV at the point where you extend the landing flaps, nice, VNAV is automatically going to set an, an appropriate speed for you. However, if you have glide slope capture already by the time that you intercept the ILS, then chances are you might have to do a little bit of uh, speed guessing over there. So you can see right now in Vina, the airplane, all on its own, resumes an airspeed that is appropriate for the conditions, even if you did not select the VREF on the approach. Now, in case that doesn't happen for whatever reason, and in case the speed window is open, There will be some sort of guidance on what speed you should fly. A general rule that is going to work for you is that you want your airspeed to be somewhere in between the amber bands. So in our case, pick a speed right in the middle, like 135 knots for example. I'm quickly going to show you what that might look like. So I'm just going to modify our scenario for a little bit. So let's say you intercept it without being in Vina. If you put your speed target somewhere in the middle between the two bands, then you will be safe. You will simply be safe at that point. It's not optimal, 
nothing the likes, doesn't matter, you will be safe. Your airplane will be flying. Okay, so we've armed the airplane for an automatic landing and that is exactly what we're going to do. The last thing we need to keep in mind is that we need some sort of braking. Now there are two ways to do this. Either somebody is going to explain to you how to use the auto brakes. If that is the case, perfect. If not, brake pedals all the way to the maximum and that's it. All you need to do. So in our case, let's assume we do not know how to use the auto brakes. So we are going to use manual brakes on this one. We let the airplane auto land and when we're on the ground, we are going to apply the brakes. And that's about as easy as it gets. So on the way in, let's enjoy the scenery a little bit over here. Overall, you are probably never going to get that lovely view again. So here we are. Okay, let's focus on our landing now. The airplane is going to land itself and what matters now is that you will be met by emergency services on the ground. So, if you're a flight simmer with experience, do not attempt to taxi the airplane. Simply stop it on the runway, shut the engines, and then emergency services are going to help you out. Alright, we are coming up on the final approach and Autoland is going to do its job to bring us down, and once we're on the runway, all we need to do is to apply manual braking. And that is simply pushing the upper parts of the paddle, so your tips forward. Okay, here we go. We're on the ground, maximum manual braking. And if you know how to do it, try to keep the airplane on the runway. If not, just let it go straight. You aren't going to die just because you leave the runway. Here we go, standing. Okay, with the airplane standing, there is just one more thing for you to do. Shutting the engine down. It doesn't matter if your airplane isn't configured correctly. Chances are it's gonna go into maintenance anyway. Alright, and that's it. From here on, your cabin crew will know how to open the doors and let emergency services on board to take care of your pilots and that is all there is to it. So, I absolutely hope you're never going to get into the situation but if you do, let's just quickly talk about the most important points. Number one, use the radio. Dial in 1 to 1.5 and use your COM1. Remember how to use the radio. You've got two switches on the back of your control column. The upper one is the push to talk for the radio. The lower one doesn't matter to you. So the upper part is what you want to use. Make your mayday call. Just by going mayday, 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 and then your airline plus the flight number, for example. But even if you don't, if you just say mayday, air traffic control will be able to find you somehow because they can locate an airplane when you are transmitting. So they will know who you are. And then be sure to state very clearly that your pilots are unconscious or unable to fly and you are not a pilot. And that will be enough to set off a chain of events in air traffic control and in nearby aircraft around who are going to be able to help you out over the radio. From there on, they will talk you down. And as you just saw in our example, there is not a lot you need to do. Set the courses, set the frequencies for an ILS, set the altitude down to zero, and let the computers do their job getting you down. When that is done, all you need to do is to configure the airplane for an auto land, which is simply pressing approach, engaging the second autopilot as needed, getting out the flaps and the landing gear. And finally, once you're on that runway, apply those brakes. Here's a little showcase, by the way. Just press those paddles forward, and that is all you need to do. When you're on the ground, shut the engines, and 
from there on, cabin crew is going to be able to take over. And that is your safest bet to survive a case where both pilots pass out. Thank you very much for watching everyone. I do hope you've enjoyed this one. Do let me know in the comments below and I am really looking forward to what you think about the video. Leave a like if you liked it, comment to let me know what you think about it and subscribe to the channel for more. And if you really, really love my videos, I would appreciate a small donation through the Buy Me Coffee link in the video description below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you all again on the next one.